One of my sponsors is the Job Creators Network, and they have become freedomtowork.com. And I have lined up you and the Governor Bevin, and I'm going to go find Doug Ducey, my friend in Arizona, because no one in America understands this issue, and they've got to understand that it has terrible impacts, especially in a high employment economy, on people who want to move. Will you lay out for us what we're trying to get done here? Well, Hugh, you, you are so right. You know, we have a great economy right now. Our unemployment rate is 3.6%. You know, it hasn't been this good literally in most of our lifetimes. Um, and we need folks, you know, we need folks that, that you know, to work. Um, and we have military spouses and individuals all across the country who want to work. But they have a barrier, which is occupational licensing. Almost one in three Americans now need a license to do something very simple, which is just to work. You know, in one state where I was at, to install fire alarms, you need a license. And what's worse is the license to install fire alarms in that state costs more than the license to join the legal bar. And that's just crazy. This is impacting those who can least afford it. It's impacting Americans who want to work. And so occupational licensing needs reform. You know, you mentioned uh, Governor Ducey. Arizona has done a great job. Um, they've, they've lowered the barriers. They've uh, almost eliminated uh, occupational licensing for workers that are coming into the state. But one issue that we're focused on right now is the issue of military spouses. There, there are families all across this nation who depend our nation and who every two years more or less have to move. Now, I've got many, many members of my family in that category, including one cousin who's a physician's assistant who's in Virginia Beach right now while her husband is deployed to Guam and to D.C. She stays put because once you get licensed somewhere, there are huge barriers to entry, even if you're a very extraordinarily credentialed person. Now, you could fix this with preemption regulations, couldn't you? Or does it have to be state legislation? Well, you know, we could fix it with preemption regulations. We could do this nationally, but, you know, we, we, we believe in small government. We believe that this should remain at the state. And so what we're doing is we're working with governors across the nation. You mentioned Governor Bevin. You know, he's, uh, he's been a great leader. Governor Reynolds in Iowa have been a great leader. And so these military spouses, when, when, when the service member is deployed from one state to another, they have a horrible choice. Give up their career or separate their family. And so what we're saying is if, if a military spouse is in a state just for a year or two to keep the family unit together, we believe in families, let them work, recognize the license from their home state. So, so in, 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 in the case of your family member, if they're licensed in, in Virginia and, and, the, the, and the military service member is in, in Washington, D.C. or Guam or elsewhere, recognize that Virginia license. Let them work. It's real simple. Now, I can, I can also come up with, and by the way, there's a website, freedomtowork.com, which I would encourage everyone to go to who get, is touched by this issue and band together, because it literally hundreds of thousands of people have to deal with this, but they each think they're alone because the red tape is specific to their profession. You and I are both lawyers. You sadly went to Harvard Law School. I went to a real law school at Michigan. I did my undergrad with uh-huh. you at Harvard. Which, which house were you, by the way, in at, at Harvard? Uh, I was Elliott House. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Preppy. Preppy, Secretary of Labor. Uh, in any event, uh, the, the the fact could be you could also put out a model statute for legislatures, or we could just use Arizona's. How does this Department of Labor push the states here to move on this? Well, you know, we, uh, we recently met with 12 governors, and Governor Bevin and Governor Reynolds volunteered to, to take the lead with the governors, um, and, and they have model legislation. And they are pushing it in their respective states. And, you know, this is such a big issue. We're, we're, we estimate there are approximately 690,000 military spouses. And, and, and about half of those, according to our data, about half of those say they're underemployed, that they're not fully utilizing their credentials, that, that they could be working more, that they're part-time and want to go full-time. And so it's our hope that these governors are going to become leaders that they're going to pass this legislation in each of their states. Um, you know, this can be fixed, and it should be fixed. These are military spouses. Um, you know, we recruit a soldier, but we retain a family. To keep these families in our military, and we all want that, we need to respect the right of their spouse to something real simple, the right to work.
Well, you just touched on the other aspect, the national security aspect of this. Retention is an issue, especially among young officers uh, coming up on their four and six year enlistment. Sometimes at 10, they choose to get out. They often get out because their uh, their spouse has built a professional life or a, uh, a craft life that depends upon a license that is not easily transferred. I'm wondering if there isn't something, though, that could be done complementary of the state efforts. Uh, Secretary Acosta, for example, uh, a regulation that says if you're licensed in two states, you're going to be licensed everywhere. To a certain extent, that respects federalism. But if you've satisfied two states, doesn't it seem obvious? I, again, Harvard Law, we got to break this down. I do this with Senator Cotton all the time. But if you're if you've been licensed in two states, that sort of suggests that the federalism aspect has been met and that there's a standard general to at least a couple or maybe five states or three states that would uh, preempt any contrary legislation at the state level because there will be some barriers to entry that are supported by very large guilds. That you know, you know what I'm talking about. Unions. I, I, I hear. I know entirely what you're talking about. You know, um, I was talking to my spouse who's an attorney. Oh. She was working supermarket. The the, the the state that she was in just would not recognize her license. Um, and so you're right. This could be done. Uh, while respecting federalism at the national level, but we're hoping it's done by the governors. When did you gather the governors together, Secretary Acosta? Uh, we gathered them during the, the National Governors Association Conference here in Washington uh, just about two months ago. Um, you know, Governor Bevin has moved forward on this in Kentucky. Governor Reynolds has moved forward this in Iowa. And you know, we had a dozen governors in the room, and they all said, we believe in this. We're going to move this legislation forward in our state. Did anyone raise the counter argument, you know, that we need these tests, we need coursework, we need continuing? You know, there are a lot of make up obstacles that I hear, especially in things like uh, hair care industry, especially in, in the physician's uh, assistant world. The Bar Association, I don't think we're ever going to beat them. You and I both know it's nonsense, uh, but but we're never going to beat them because that's a. That's a savvy group of lobbyists in every state, and they are very, very concerned about retirees hanging out there, shingle in Florida and New York and other places like that. But what about the the other objections that come out? Uh, did you hear any of them voiced? Did you have answers for them? Well, you know, um, all, you know, all, I, I think as a group, the governors look at occupational licensing as barriers, and, and they would love to have them reduced. Uh, last year, I actually worked with governors in South Dakota and North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado to try to reduce the number of occupational licenses and barriers in, in their states. And they were all unanimous on this issue. You know, do we really need a license for hair braiding? Do we need a license to be a, 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 a cook? Um, and, and I think the answer is, is pretty straightforward. Um, the issue that they run into is at the legislative level in their states, these are strong lobbies. And unfortunately, the lobbies want to keep the barriers to work high because it protects the incumbent worker. But, you know, we need, you know, we have one million more jobs in this nation than we have people looking for jobs. That's amazing. And so we need to, we need to lower these barriers. We've never, since we've been keeping this data, we've never had a situation where we have more open jobs and folks looking for jobs. But at the same time, we have fewer and fewer people working because we're imposing these barriers to work. And now, we look, need to come down. Look, freedomtowork.com. I'll, I'll get people that I'll remind them after the break. I want to close by asking you about the employment situation. I just had Tim Ryan on. He's an old friend of mine. He's wrong about everything, and I won't vote for him ever. But he's an old friend, and he made the same argument that John Delaney made to me yesterday, that wages aren't rising fast enough. You're the Secretary of Labor. I thought r- wages are, in fact showing very healthy gains as this employment market extraordinary in its strength uh, ripples out in its effect on demand for, for good labor. So, so here are some facts, just, just plain facts. Wages are rising faster than they've risen in a decade. Um, wages are rising uh, over 3% now on an annualized basis and have been consistently rising over 3% for the last several months. And, and two things that people don't talk about, Blue-collar wages, for the first time in a long, long time, are rising faster than supervisory, supervisory managerial wages. And that's important because it shows that the growth is, is impacting everyone in the economy. And in the lowest decile, in the, in the, in the lowest 10% of, of wage earners, wages are rising at more than 6% per year. That 
that's that is remarkable. My hat is off to you. This is a remarkable record. The president talking about it in Florida last night. Please come back and talk about it more and about freedom to work dot com. Secretary Acosta, I have no time to ask you about squash, which is obligatory for an Elliott House alum. But another time, come back early. Freedom to work dot com. That's Labor Secretary Alex Acosta. Great to have him on. 